this morning I wanted to show you in one side some pictures, as we said yesterday, we need some pictures. And uh, then I will go into this particular work of this uh, artist, James Dumas, and tell you more about it later. But prior to this, I want to show you those five photographs, one of those you see here, um, which is uh, out of the former Czechoslovakian archive of social security. Uh, uh, this archive you see here uh, is called Le Grand Classeur Mécanique. It's like a, a work by Fernand Léger and built by two French architects just prior to uh, World War II, prior to the occupation of Czechoslovakia by, by uh, German fascists. Uh, 38, and those images are made in 43, 44, those photographs. Um, it's an extraordinary archive, I'm looking at the library there. <laughs> uh, it's an absolutely extraordinary archive. And Le Grand Classeur Mécanique means that those people who you see here, I mean, I see it better than, you know, it's a really poor machine there, but, uh, uh, so, they work in this archive, they have cars. So they come into the archive, they sit in the car, and then they can go up and down, it's 10 meters high, and they have a range of 3 meters each, to the left, to the right. And there's a second motor, which you see here, which goes into the file, which is 3 meters deep. And they give it a number of the file count they want to have, like 25,743. And they put it, the number in there, and the machine, the motor, zzz, takes the file count, the whole file hours up to the file count. And then they sit, as you can see here, on the desk and in the worker. It's an extraordinary uh, And it's in Prague. And uh, gives you an idea. It is a cube, the whole thing. And in the two, well, you can't see it here in the natural curves. It's a cube, and they built the cube first, and then the architecture around it, which is quite unusual. Is it still in use today? And I went to see it about four years ago. Nothing has changed. <laughs> the only thing which has changed that after September 11, the very intelligent director said he needed a grant in order to digitize everything, uh, saying this is this is the, the, the heritage of Czechoslovakia, the Social Security Archive, which goes back to the 19th century. And he got this grant to digitize 40 million file cards. And uh, they did this within two years. They digitized everything. Okay. With those, you probably may have seen once, those Kodak scanners, which are extraordinary machines. You know, they can put the folders in, not the file cards, the folders with all the file cards in. And the machine automatically opens up, and draws, like breathing, draws everything in, and then you have a screen, which is uh, uh, where you can visualize and then it scans in an extraordinary velocity, everything. And on the screen, it's like an engine bike. You zoom, 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 all the images pass. You can't really see anything. And then they have a, a recognition software, which then files everything. And when I asked him, uh, well, so what, what are you doing with the analog archive now, since you have digitized everything? And he laughed and he said, what do you mean? I mean, this is our archive. Digital is just the backup. <laughs> I like this very much. And everybody tried to buy this archive, the Japanese and one of the Americans, because it's such an extraordinary thing. Um, you know, coming out of a Kafka novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the name of it? It's Le Grand Classeur yeah. Mécanique. Le Brazil. Terry Gilliam's movie Brazil. Yeah, yeah. You can always think about this now. Yeah. So, Classeur is, you know, 
for sensing is classifier. Uh, and it's it's you know about roughly ten years after Bernard Leger made his film Le Ballet Mécanique on modern times. When, when I when I discovered this in the, so I discovered those photographs of this here in, in Montreal. And if, I mean, like here, you see, it's, it's you know, like, it's like a musical rhythm you know, here with the machines and this, this wave. Uh, where I mean, the human being really has just become a part of the chain and a mechanization chain. But the mechanization chain is within a production knowledge. So all what is in here is knowledge production. Uh, and for me it became, in a certain way, like an allegory for photography. The way of the archive. And an allegory for the archive. The way you exceed, access the access uh, to the archive. Do you think that built something like that for photography or wood? Anybody? Well, for anything. Well, today you wouldn't be to do this anymore. Uh, because you, today uh, the archives, you, you know, you build up, uh, I'm official archives. Mm -hmm. uh, you try, if you build up a new archive today, you would start digital, I suppose. But all the other the archives of photography you have, they're not digital. I do, I, unless, uh, except those, the New York Times archive and so the, the newspaper archive. But they're only partial still. See? It's they're only partially done. It, it's partially done uh, and many stopped because it's just too expensive. So, yeah. You, you can't. Um, I mean, I remember I was involved in Berlin many years ago, or roughly 10 years ago. They, they wanted to start a, a, a Berlin Museum for Photography and resemble all the collection in Berlin, so West and East Berlin. And uh, uh, they started working on this, and they discovered there are in Berlin approximately 13 million photographs in all the different collections. And uh, from those 13 million photographs, so from the 19th century, beginning so in the 40s till today, uh, of, of those 30 million photographs, roughly 1% was known. 1%. Uh, so about 130,000. The rest was in the archives and has never ever been uh, uh, archived. So in boxes. And it's an extraordinary wealth of knowledge which is in there. And anybody can have access to it? Uh, you, anybody can have access. But you do not know to what you have access, which is the most beautiful yeah. idea of the archive. Yeah. You know, you remember. Uh, of course, the librarian would say you you crazy, <laughs> <laughs> because you have to know what you're looking for. <laughs> but this is all the question, like in in uh, in uh, you know this the, the, when uh, Walter Benjamin describes his uh, work in the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris. When he's always at this at, at the file, you know, the, the, the cardboard files, and, and looking for something, but always, of course, discovering something else. And and this is the question of those archives. So how to how to deal with this? And they wanted then the, the, the director, and at that time uh, who was an idiot, said, uh, uh, well, we just take the best of everything. Which of course you know. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, so they take Ajay and whatever all the known known figures, but they do not go into everything which is you know hidden and which is filled with promises for a possible future and we haven't recognized it yet. And this is our task, of course, to do so. So the Library of Congress, parts of it are online and you can access it online, but. That idea, which I was, you were talking about duplication, is such an issue with the digitizing. Because some of them are low res, some of them are high res, some of them are in mediums that you know it just aren't translating very well, even though they were photography. They were maybe done on a format that no longer really goes into the black and white. Yeah. You lose the nuances. Yeah. So, 
And this is why this is why they go mostly they go back to to the like he said for his file cards. Or, or they know they lit, very few images only. There are some insurance him and photographs as well uh, to the analog archive. Uh, and because I mean, you, you know how much it costs to store a digital archive. Uh, it's extremely expensive. And all the I mean I know it from from Britain, from England. Uh, they are. The same, there are millions. In Birmingham, you have archives, photograph archives, millions of photographs. And nobody can work with them. You don't have the manpower, you can't pay it. So they will, you know, they've remained there for 100 years. And they will remain uh, for another 100 years there. Because it's impossible. Which is a huge problem, I think. Because our, uh, the subject here is, you know, the, the knowledge, well, we may ask what is knowledge, but uh, uh, which, is, which is retained by those photographs, which are everywhere. And the context we, are, we may be giving to those photographs, we can't, because we don't have the photographs, although they're there. So there's a problem of, not of duplication, but in a certain way of, when we said yesterday, the question of the der Bogen, yeah. uh, and uh, remember the translation to find the language and the other language, as you say. Uh, we can't. But you were saying yesterday there was a lot of money in Germany for this sort of um, investigation of academic and art. Yes, of course it is, but not they for... They can't a team to... to it's, uh, you know, you, you, they, they calculate it in Berlin. I mean, you know better yeah. than I do. They calculate in Berlin, uh, I think, to digitize now for those 30 million photographs, mm. to go through them. You need about, I think, 250 years uh, to go through them. And then you try to divide this by manpower, by manpower or woman power and, 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 and hours. Uh, and then you come down, you need 500 people to work for, I don't know how many years uh, to, to go through it. You can't, you can't pay it. I still think there are possibilities, but it's, it's extraordinarily expensive. And then, what do you do then? Because once you have, if you digitize them, uh, you have to work with the software, the hardware, you have to renew it constantly. You have to re-translate or converge uh, the files onto the others all the time in order to keep them... Uh, uh Current and accessible. Yeah. It's a huge problem. It's going to be a problem for newspapers also, I think, the way they're going. Yeah. You know, so you most of the large... You're getting that software or you're going to lose knowledge someplace. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, it actually relates back to the question of duplication in a kind of very direct way. Um, in North America, we have extremely uh, we have we've established standards for uh, bitrate degradation. We do systematic audits of um, our deep archives, our deep digital archives, which are which are spread out across multiple servers around North America and elsewhere. So there's there are standards, and this is a technical component that I'm not very familiar with, but there are specific standards that determine at what point um, a physical comparison is necessary um, and, and returning to uh, a rescan image. Well, that's cool. It's extremely expensive. I mean, yeah. the, the, that's, that sounds expensive in terms of the technical stuff, but, um, but what we're talking about here in terms of these kinds of photographs, the, the, mecha the mechanics of scanning things is costly and buying terabytes of space is costly but um, the, the actually having people to yeah. describe things in a way that makes it rational for researchers yeah. is phenomenally expensive. Yeah. It is the difference between knowledge and archive, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly oh. right. An archive that is uncatalogued and unindexed in any way is just a pile of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a question when you start to be more that guy. I propose that uh, I was on the uh, NEA Federal Arts Policy Panel a couple years ago, the first online one, and I propose that that be a WPA project. What is a WPA? A, a new, uh, work Projects Administration, a new one, uh, a new art in action project that, to put all the new college graduates to work that are going to be out of work for 10 years. Uh, or five years or two years or whatever because of the economy to, to put them to work doing this kind of infrastructure building which is for the information superhighway in the 30s it was uh, building roads or building these other things but you know the, the quality of people coming out of university 
um, who are facing economic hardship now, this is a good way for at least to have a job with dignity and have some money. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. There are solutions, it's just a question of what, where you're going to cite your social investments. Yeah. I mean, even the Mechanical Turk give it to many people just so they can do like 15 minutes of work of it. You know, 15 minutes of work to lots of people. Yes, but you know, it, it's been, the, you know, the question is how reliable this is. Yeah, yeah. yeah so no, I think there's a level of so training, training like right? Yeah. Yeah. kind of supervision. So it's, it's, we don't want to go into it. It's yeah. very complex. Who, who is, who's the photographer? I missed that. Um, I don't know. Oh. You know, who did, did those photographs? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Nobody knows. Yeah. Uh, it's anonymous. Yeah. The architect, I could tell you, I forgot. Uh, but uh, there are two French architects. I can I can look later on. I can look this up. Um, it's uh, an architect and, and an engineer uh, from uh, Lyon, I think it was. Um, yeah. So this I can find. But the, the photographer, no. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, it's a huge problem. And you know, they for the archive as well. They start with the recognition software, but you know, this is dramatic because you you unify uh, everything and you go by certain, in fact, commodifications and fictionalizations. Uh, you do not draw out possible knowledge, but you cover with what you think you know already. And this is a problem. It's the, the wrong way. There's no punto. The machines do not know any punto. It also just doesn't account. I mean, there's all these pragmatic solutions you can imagine, but at the same time, there's this huge psychological sort of anxiety that, that takes place. I have a friend that was part of the BBC archive at the British National Library, and she used to like, kind of be physically ill walking through the spaces and looking at boxes and stuff that you know, represented four years of her life. <laughs> yeah. She just didn't know how to get across the threshold of that possibility of even looking inside the document. You know, yeah. I mean, it's the, when I used to work at the, the Canadian Center for Architecture, I brought uh, in, uh, um, with CCA, we bought uh, the, the archive of Golden Butter Club. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to go to the Getty. And uh, since there were so many architectural archives already in, in, in CCA, in, in Golden Butter Club, I don't know how much you know him, was trained as an architect in Cornell, uh, and was very European in his work. Uh, so Montreal was the best idea. And so I succeeded to, to convince. Uh, Jane Crawford, the, the winner. And um, uh, there came all his notebooks, his library, and all sketchbooks, uh, and some works, but very little of his works, because the deal was yes, but not the artworks. Because, you know, this is the market still. <laughs> and and uh, uh, it, it became very difficult to archive, and I started archiving and archive everything, because um, there were again and again stickers. Uh, you know, posted stickers by Jane on, on, on the archival stuff where she wrote, could become a work of art. <laughs> <laughs> so it means, you know, know, yeah. uh, so she was uh, allowed to, to take it out to, to bring it to the market. Hmm. Which is, you know, this is, a, of course, the absurd situation for any archive. Hmm. Uh, it is. And, but then we made a show which was called, because they had box, which was called Out of the Box. Just to, you know, because it is a crazy, you are always in those basements mm. uh, uh, working uh, archivally. Uh, and um, so we brought everything out and, and just showed archives, which was great. Anyway, okay, this is a large topic. Um, So, uh, to contextualize a little bit, <coughs> um, and I may repeat this in, in, in this small text, uh, Thomas de Man uh, uh, has become a, a very famous uh, 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 
artist working with photography. And after having had a show, I think it was in, in 2002 or five in, at the MoMA, uh, he got a show in 2009 in Berlin, at the National Gallery. And, uh, uh, which was called National Gallery. I'll talk a bit about this. Um, and uh, I was so much enraged by this then I, I felt like doing something. So I wrote something for, for a, a paper which is called Lettre Internationale, which is a political, uh, uh, excellent uh, paper, News, not a newspaper, a journal, about this. And this is more or less, it's, it's changed because it uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, been, has been translated. Um, uh, but my, the, the, the genuine question was how much History can there be in the work of art today? What is history? And um, uh, the paper is called uh, Pictures on Demand <laughs> The Diversity of the Historical and the Simplicity of the Artistic. And, uh, and here again, I will, I will hand over you the, so you get it. The, the paper. Um, and it has uh, two um, epitaphs. The one is by the German writer Otto Strauss, who's a great contemporary author, and wrote for the catalogue within the book, uh, the catalogue for Thomas de Mar for the show. And uh, the quote by Otto Strauss reads, not only does the tragedy of history repeat as a farce, to quote the Marx, Marx. But the fact that we cannot escape this farce anymore takes on tragical moments. Okay? And the second is by Nietzsche on the use and abuse of history for life. It says historical education and the universal code of the uniform of the middle class together both ruin this he wrote, as you know, in the 70s of the United century. So, 15 years ago, so in, in 94, 5, 95, <laughs> I curated a show called Photography After Photography, which essentially tried to see how the image of time, of history, and of our seizing of history was affected by the digital term. Thirty artists were invited with their works. Two quotes were path guiding for the idea of the show. One is when Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz and Paul Strand undertook a survey into the importance of photography as an aesthetic medium in the beginning of the 20th century, beginning of the first quarter in 1922. Marcel Duchamp, who was asked by them, was not short of a reply. On May 22nd, 1922, he wrote, I quote, Dear Stieglitz, just a few words which I do not really even want to write. You know well what I think of photography. I would like it to make people despise painting. That is, until something else makes photography unbearable. That's how far we have come. Which is a great sentence. In 1922. And the second quote was adapted by, by Jean-François Lyotard, uh, and his quote was, as you may know, after philosophy comes philosophy, but it is altered by the after. So we replace philosophy by photography. After photography comes photography, but it's altered by the after. In the 30s, so some years after the quote by Duchamp, Walter Benjamin lamented that photography was emancipating itself more and more from any 
quote, physiognomic, political, scientific interest and was now aspiring to be creative. According to Benjamin, this aspiration to creativity betrays a photographic attitude, quote, which can mount any tin can in space, but cannot grasp any more a human context. And, you know, this is... <coughs> uh, uh, Benjamin wrote this in his small history of photography, when he wrote about the book of uh, Albert, Albert Ringer-Patsch, uh, which was a book which published in 1925, called Die Welt ist schön, The World is Beautiful which became a very famous photo book. And Benjamin severely wrote against this photo book very much. Because there was no human context at all. <coughs> and it was like the Brechtchen say that you don't photograph the, the, uh, a factory anymore to denounce or denunciate the, the exploitation of labor which is done inside, but you photograph the factory because it's nice. So there is no context. How does today's artistic practice react to the almost unlimited digital possibilities for montage? For, as Eisenstein put it, montage is the extension of the moment. What is the extension of the moment today? Are we to expect in a historical return, a post aesthetization of photography determined by soft and hardware? Or would it be possible not just to continue the history of representation in the analogical numerical translation, but also to actually think it anew? Those were the questions in the show Photography After Photography, uh, in which started in Germany in 95 and then traveled to Philadelphia and, and, and to Europe and, and to Germany. Now, 15 years later, I want to speak, let me see if, yeah, I want to speak, and you can interrupt me, hmm? so it's more, it's more léger than uh, this paper. Hmm? Uh, I will speak about the retrievability of images. Retrievability of images, public images, and the remainders of reality in them. I do not myself intend to be hide behind my text, nor do I presume to claim theory here, but instead to express my unease directly in my own words or in the words of others. And I asked you to accept, <coughs> of course, that nothing here is meant personally. That is, it applies to the person of an artist, but at the same time that nothing or everything is fiction. Ten years ago, so in 2000 it was, I showed myself the work of Thomas de Malt and Andreas Gursky in an exhibition about photography and recollection in art, entitled Tomorrow Forever. I have since taken part in various debates about simulation and dissimulation, on photo photographic referentiality, on the phenomenology of photography, on the repressed or on the Foucauldian dispositives. And although I do not wish to take anything back, I do believe that an essential determination of criticism should be that it not isolates a formal aesthetic aspect of the artwork, but recognizes in that work an essential existential voice, which speaks of human conditions today and whose enlightenment and perhaps even continuation in language must be the concern. The genesis of the artwork and its critique have the joint task of working on a presence and its historical conditions. Both are in lived and in historical time, 
irrespective of their particular media configurations. Although the photographic work, of course, links to specific discourse and, to quote John Tag, burn of representation. Neither the artwork nor its critique is subject to functionalization by social practices, whose receptacle they may well be. Nevertheless, both have a high responsibility, which I cannot formulate here, but which is adequately delineated in the words of John Cage, who said, responsibility is the ability to respond. End of quote. I simply cannot understand the euphoria with which people greet the monumentalist, monumentalist history images of Andreas Kulski and Thomas de Mart. Late capitalist kitsch, curtly servile images lacking completely in critical or any other substance. My discontent, therefore, applies not only to the images themselves, their absence of substance, which is replaced by appearance and by high-sounding simulation of discourse. It also applies to the public journalistic <coughs> and so-called art-critical reception of the works, the flourishes, flor the flourishes of its eulogies, eulogies, eulogies. As recently, so 2010, in an article of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Thomas Dimmert, which said, quote, that is what is important for this artist, Thomas Dimmert, to communicate that in a time that is collapsing under fiction, the fictive can also be faked. End of quote. Admittedly, this statement is not easy to understand, or it is perfectly banal. Staged, stating the third degree of the simulacro, Baudrillard developed in the early 80s. And the critique adds that scarcely any other, any other artist has a greater appetite for the associative. End of quote. The reception of an image opens up the space of observation, and it is the second, latter, later gaze that tries to recognize for itself in the image the becoming and reverberating of the first initial gaze. In this tension between what is the posed self and what is the projected otherness, like between proximity and distance, time unfolds as the possibility of a historical space. But photography unveils a historical space only by its proper specificity, as Krakow would say. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, debate which occurred in the 20s in mainly Germany, in fact, around photography. It was before, linked to the Frankfurt School, in fact, to the critical theory, the early times of the Frankfurt School, that is the early Adorno, and then uh, uh, mainly, uh, and film, uh, it was Siegfried Krakow. Does this sound a bell? Krakow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Krakow. Krakow. K? I'll see. Let's see. K. K. Two K? No. Oh, oh, the first is K. Yeah. yeah the first. Krakow. Right. And Krakow, before Benjamin, uh, um, wrote an important uh, newspaper article on photography in the late 20s uh, where he stated that uh, photography needs to keep its specificity that is grasp a moment in an historical time. 
so not falsifying the consolation of time and space, which in, in American words you would call straight fuck. So it was in the 20s, which was just, you know, the, the late time of the debate, which was mainly a debate in America uh, by students uh, on pictorial photography and straight photography. So the pictorial photography, which was in fact, if we recall yesterday, was a kind of mimesis, my medical photography, because it alienated to painting and went by painting uh, uh, from photography towards painting back to photography by retouching, working hard, working severely the negative, by having certain uh, specificities in the printing, like, uh, um, how do you say it, uh, in, in English, uh, gum printing, uh, platinum printing, different, different uh, printing. Uh, uh, and up to a degree where you could not differentiate anymore because it was a sketch of painting or a photograph. So against this uh, uh, and coming up the documentary photography, the straight photography, uh, there was quite an important debate. And Krakow in Germany participated as Benjamin did later on. And for Krakow, uh, uh, the most important was that the medium of photography, like the medium of film, which he mainly considered later, had to uh, keep within the technical dispositive uh, uh, that, it, 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 that it was photography. So no retouching uh, of the negative, uh, uh, no montage. He was actually against montage. Of course, as you know, later, Arfield and, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, Anna Hölzing and others, they went and used montage as political mean. Um, uh, yeah, so this was the debate in the 20s. Um, so, but photography unveils an in, uh, in historical space only by its proper specificity, specificity, as Krakow would say. No, uh, it's a, Krakow is with a K. Anyway, um, that is to put an end to the becoming. Um, uh, but to speak today of truth and lies in photography, as is constantly done in the reception of the work of Thomas de Mann, which I will show you in a minute, is to pursue not so much the also pursued Platonic reference in the reception of Thomas de Mann's work, Plato's Politea is constantly mentioned. But to speak, about, to speak today of truth and lies in photography is more to invoke the statement Adorno in the 50s handed to Hollywood. By saying nothing about the lie, we do not therefore tell the truth. This was Adorno in the 50s, famous sentence. Um, Let me see if, sorry, just a two. Um, I want to, because I don't have this reference in here, I want to start showing you those images, uh, which you see here which are not by, uh, by Thomas Demann, but are by Andreas Gruski. And Gruski uh, uh, made those images in 2006-07 in uh, Pyongyang. And it was his dream to go to Pyongyang to photograph the yearly festival of uh, Pyongyang. Uh, which you may have shown, seen, is the festival uh, is uh, that all those pupils, uh, 100,000, 
they come together, they, they live the history like in a book, uh, cinematographically in a book, of the young history of North Korea. So they change. And you can see, if you have seen the film of this, uh, uh, they change, they are, they are treated severely uh, so they can perform this, uh, the history of the 50 years of, of North Korea. And uh, uh, it is the, the, the biggest festival, which is absolutely terrible because everybody's instrumentalized uh, for this. And uh, Andreas Gorski went there with the argument that those were the colors that he still needed for his oeuvre. For his what? Oeuvre, for his, for his, for his artwork. But, but oeuvre means already, you know, uh, his major work. And I don't know how much you're familiar with Andreas Gulski's work. <laughs> he said, no. I mean, he, he became, uh, 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 Gulski was one of the, the uh, um, you may have followed, in the 80s, in Germany, a school of photography was built up by the Bechers. Bechers? Bechers. Bechers. Um, I don't want to go too much in there, but... but uh, Bechers. Now, Tina Becher, there's a couple. They got, since you just came back from Venice, they got in the late 70s uh, the golden line for their work. Photographic work, but they got it uh, for sculpture. And you certainly have seen uh, their works. They, they photographed industrial architecture uh, uh, in series, and they made the so-called typologies. And out of their teaching at the Düsseldorf Art Academy came the so-called Becher class, which was an extraordinary commodification of photography of the art market. Uh, by the most famous became then Andreas Kowski uh, and Thomas Ruff and many others, and who then raised the prices of photography on the art market. And Golski was the first to go beyond the one million dollar uh, 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 limit. So is he the first to make the as large as there? And sorry? Is he the first to make them as large yes. as there? And well others have done it before, but mm -hmm. they didn't like have, get this this uh, attention. And he made them extraordinarily large. So the last words you may have seen, which were just exhibited uh, about half a year ago. Uh, in Berlin, um, they are about eight meters, seven meters high, six, six, seven meters high, and four meters wide. And uh, uh, it's reconfiguring the earth. What Gursky did, he took, he took Google images uh, of the earth, but he changed the configuration uh, of the continents, which is completely dark and of no interest. Uh, but it's, of course, it is a, a, a quite a impressive situation if you are in the gallery and you have those. It's like the church, and you have these enormous pictures, which are coated in a very glossy surface, dye transfer prints. So you've reflected in there, and you have this. So it's it's uh, it's quite impressive. But after the first impression, you see that there's just no content anymore. It's just a, a, like a salon painting, in fact, that you had in the nineteenth century. But what I was so shocked was that uh, he could go to Pyongyang, and Pyongyang is known as a severe dictator, di 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 dictator, dictator, and. Uh, if you read, and everybody, I suppose, who would do so, to go to make anything in a, in a, in a uh, uh, country where human rights are so severely oppressed, would read the Amnesty International Report of the year. And then you would read the year where Gursky went to uh, um, Pyongyang. Uh, uh, how many 
uh, people were in the prisons, how they were tortured. Uh, and one of the tortures you have in, in Korean uh, prisons, which is the torture which comes from China, in fact, is uh, that people are not allowed to uh, to sit, but they have to be during hours and hours like this. They're not allowed to move. If they move, they get electroshocks. And during 20, 12 hours, 24 hours, they can't because they break together. Uh, and they have the it's everything is listed. Uh, the, the most uh, t absolute terrible thing. And everybody knows this as well, and we all know that North Korea is a, is a dictator, dictator. And that somebody can, with the argument, he needs this, those colors for his oeuvre, uh, like a pictorialist, in fact, can go to North Korea, uh, and there's no upraisal of, of criticism. And all those critiques, which write for museum shows and others, they don't say anything. They only comment how Gursky, and they comment in like a louange with a, how he goes with a Louis Vuitton a suitcase where his objectives are. And he goes into the loge of, uh, of Kim Jong-il, uh, who has the best the view to the spectacle, to make the photographs, which is uh, and I was, you know, despised this profound. Um, and this is the result. So, of course, you cannot forbid this. But this is exactly the contrary of what, uh, 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 following John Cage, what is the responsibility of the artist? It is the ability to respond. And here is just the it's not, he's not responding, but in fact, it's again, all what photography is, as we said yesterday. And there is its po political power as well, being the end of any mimetical representation. And he, on the contrary, takes up mimesis again, a, a representation. And by this covers completely the political disaster uh, which rules, I mean, not only North Korea as we know but specifically there at that moment. And here I brought this, so I, as I told you, it was a very polemical conference. Here you see, so, image of Pyongyang and Volkswagen in Wolfsburg, it's near my school, they give me money as well, I must say. <laughs> uh, uh, they uh, bought about four of those works. So each work about a quarter million of euros. Also. And you see here, and he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a new guy, I must say. But anyway, he's the director of the museum of Wolfsburg, Markus Brüderlin. This is the CEO of Volkswagen. This is the work. This is Andreas Bosky, the artist. And this is the critique, Ranger Spies. So it's like an allegory of power play. You have within art criticism, uh, museum, collection. It's, it's everything you need. You need an artist, doesn't matter if it's good or bad. But you need a critique. He must have been very good once, so he has to not. And must have a good situation so he can bring up the artist. You need a good museum director who is willing to accept this work and who has a, quite a, 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 a name in the museum and you need the money by industry and capital um, to buy the work and then the, you know, the cycle goes on and on. Then a spitz. This one? This one, I have no idea. I took it out of the... Yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's uh, huh? With the news or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still it's... There's, there's more said in that statement, in, in that photo than there is. Mm -hmm. No, but at least I, I, I love this photo because yeah, you know it's true. really you could, you could, I, I did not publish it because, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I love this. Yeah. Um, <coughs> this uh, 
um, points to a very large question, dilemma for art and art criticism in the current era, if you will. What, if any, are the responsibilities of the artist? Not to mention all the other players in the field of contemporary art, the, the field of interest that populates contemporary art, to put it in a sort of sociological context, or almost like a Bourdieuian sense. But um, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's possible anymore, or w whether it ever was, to tease out uh, theory and criticism, uh, which is which addresses the work on a purely theoretical level, than that which conflates the criticism of the work with the uh, conditions of neoliberalism and uh, so on of the art contemporary art world and market. Because to me, you can make first of all, as far as art and ethics, artists usually are very. Uh, uh, reluctant to take any ethical injunctions from above by a theorist or critic about what should be the morality of, con of the art of their day. They're usually very, very uh, rancorous towards these write, types yeah. of positions. Um, but I, I, in the case of uh, Gursky and Deman, I mean, they're sort of, in a way they operate, the sa they function the same way for maybe for the art market, but, but they... Uh, to me, their work is um, very different in a, in a sense. They're both lies, but they're lies of a different order. So, Gursky, to me, there is a truth in Gursky's work in that he's willing to aestheticize, but by any, by any means. Um, his earlier work, okay, so maybe his photog photographs of North Korea are, is a human failure, essentially, a human failure to see uh, and uh, reflexively what he's doing. But in his earlier works, um, in many of them, you see this uh, kind of beauty in the... Um, I'm not talking about the consumerist, the works that have to do with consumerism, but you see this beauty in the, the um, uh, microscopic order of people against the vastness of a landscape, for instance. I agree with you. So this is a kind of aestheticization of the world around us, even though the digital manipulated it since the beginning and all this stuff. Thomas de Mons' work, they're all painstakingly made uh, maquettes. Re, re, uh, well, we're coming forward. to this. Don't take this away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but to, as, as far as Gursky, let's, but about Thomas Mann, let's, because I haven't shown anything yet. Okay, of course, I I mean, I didn't show, if, uh, of course, Gursky's work, but then we would come into the deal. I agree with this, what you say, what one may say, uh, the human faith. Gursky's work, and I know I'm, at that time I bought works for, for, for Germany, for the German uh, government, uh, in about 50 years ago. And his early works, the small landscapes of the, of the Rhine, uh, yeah. are astonishingly beautiful. So beautiful. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I'm not supposed to say this here, but we have a little uh, uh, When I, I went to see him, and I said, well, those are the photographs I want, the small uh, Rhine landscapes to buy them for this for the collection uh, of, of the German government. And he said, yes, well, I don't have them anymore. Because, you know, they sold out. And while we were talking, the Nike shoes were, were brought in. You know, this, one of those large tableaus that Kuski made with the Prada, not the Prada uh, shop in New York by Kohlhaas, but uh, by Kuski. Uh, by 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 Nike Nike shoes, mm. which were on on big uh, shelves, and it's just as you photograph the shelves, huge thing, five meter, six meter, right. and then he Gorski said, well, you know, if you really want them and no, nothing else, what I could think of to make another format, I open a new format and we can make a new edition, and what we did in fact, what of course is crazy for the market as well, but there was a so not the small landscapes but a little larger. <laughs> and that uh, the new edition went. So I agree absolutely, and he's a great photographer, really very good photographer. His father was very trained as a photographer, everything. But you know, I mean, uh, once you do a work of art, uh, or you you seemingly it's supposed to be a work of art, and 
uh, uh, it enters the public, you do have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, some years ago I might have said more, you know, basically. But now I, I, I changed my personal completely, I must say. And perhaps this was the case one. I think you do have, you know, this world is going in such a bad way. So if, if uh, you say, you know, anything goes, then fuck off. Because this is not something we, can, we are allowed to do. I think it's a high responsibility. And so I agree what you say with human failure. And a human failure, you know, you can still, uh, you can still, uh, uh, um, how to say, uh, uh, you can make corrections. You could. Gorski could. But perhaps it's too late because he's on this uh, thing. And with Thomas Demand, it is absolutely different. But I don't want to talk because this is my. Uh, uh, all I wanted to just finish with, and I won't point to any specific artists, uh, but um, sometimes I feel like um, you have art which is dressed in critical clothing, um, but is as dishonest as a work of Gursky's, uh, which accounts for the large, <laughs> a large portion of critical art today and of many decades past. Uh, which is as ineffective critically um, for a, a number of reasons that could be gone into, but um, uh, maybe is not maybe has a good ethical intention, but unfortunately winds up in the same position, if not in a worse, more obscurantist position than a work of Gursky's, which you can, uh, you know, is sort of like to criticize a Gursky is like banging down an open door. You know, it's it's already there. <laughs> You know, it's on the surface to be criticized. Some of the things conceals its uh, insidiousness uh, more carefully. You know, um, just to let me, uh, we go on. But, uh, um, you know, I gave this uh, conference in Germany, and it was far longer, because uh, Gorski was more in the, and I, I realized I don't have him in here, and Gerhard Richter. Uh, so Gorski, Richter, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Thomas Demann. And of course, Richter is, uh, I, 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 I admire profoundly. And he has a very clear political statement in his work. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was a very long conference, I gave. And uh, there were about lots of 400, 500 students at the Art Academy in Leipzig. And professors as well. And they were in the beginning profoundly shocked that somebody dared to criticize artists who were so successful on, on the market and who were held as gods in the art academies. So no student, and I mean, I don't know how this was in Zerbrücken, but no student, and I mean, imagine beginning 21st century, no student was, it seemed, allowed to criticize some of those masters out there who have made their way. So, you know, it goes on, and this is, of course, extraordinary terrible. Yeah. So that it means that it, 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 refer, it echoes, in the worst sense of the word, from, from the other artists to the, the students who becoming artists. And there's no possibility of, of, uh, of uh, dismantling uh, of this simulation, however you may call this, uh, which is beyond any social or political reality. This is my problem. And then we go. Yes, do you want to go first? No. Okay, no. Okay, I'm good. Uh, so I think this is a beautiful lie, this, this representation of the role of art, of the responsibility of art. It, to me, this is like the, the, the uh, pundit in the Washington Post or New York Times wondering why there is no uh, movement uh, riding in the streets when the, the paper uh, and the media monopoly over decades reinforces that the populist uprising is terrible, you know, everyone should remain calm, uh, all these different uh, uh, tactics and strategies to suppress uh, democratic response to problems in the world. And so the question here is a question of curation, it's selection. You know? Yes, of course. And, and I think that when you look at the hypocrisy of putting in Switzerland, putting someone like Hirschhorn in their pavilion, when they are one of the prime financial beneficiaries of the entire war, war profiteer situation, 
is absolutely impossible to deny. And that's the truth of this photograph, which is a lie itself. You know, asking art to do these things that are really citizen responsibilities is co a com complete fabulation. And it's decades old. And photography has been used as an instrument of this from the beginning. And choosing a, a moment like this one as a, as a representation of, of moral failure on the part of art is, is in itself a, a terrible propaganda, a terrible lie. Right. And, and this is a dissuasion of, of artists investing themselves for people, for good, for local, for many things that this points to as the ultimate evil, and it's a lie. No, not ultimate evil, but I mean, uh, you, 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 you can, and I wouldn't say, I, I'm not, you know, lying truth, but, but of course you can say uh, there's a limit, no, you would not say there are limits to art, no. But you would say there's a responsibility to the artist if he or she can do such a work, be Pyongyang or wherever, or not. I would say yes. I wouldn't have said so. so I, don't, I don't disagree with this at all. I'm, I'm with Hannah Arendt in, in this, this question of responsibility yeah. and judgment. But the question is, is who gave the, the visa so he could go to... There's a, there, there is a modus operandi behind these kind of interventions. Well, you know, it's, it's very, very simple. You know, uh, um, the, the uh, Korean government, of course, was very uh, uh, delighted. So uh, delighted, Guski is coming and, and photographing. Uh, it was uh, 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 astonishing that Kim Jong Il uh, wasn't photographed himself. You know, he had a show going around here of his all his photographs, uh, all his paintings done, by, done for uh, picturing him. I, su uh, I suppose, from my perspective, that having had an uncle who fought in the Korean War against the North Koreans, um, that this this to me is very simply a, a movement toward denationalization where the individual citizen who might absolutely, on moral grounds, disagree with the, the art market sending a representative to take photographs of something like this is not ever uh, uh, offered an opportunity to be at the table in the decision-making process. You're only made to feel as if you are a passive participant in the process, and this is anti-democratic. And this is a globalist movement, this is intentional. And it's throughout the entire art market, so-called, which is not an art market, but a representation of globalist uh, corporate economy. Well, and that's I what this art is for. I think, I think the issue is really to define the, the difference between responsibility and role. And sorry? Role. R -O -N -E. Rule. Role. Role. Role, yeah. And I think this is where um, this is where the fine line is. By taking responsibility, it doesn't mean we we're, we have to play a role in society. And this is where I feel, in my view, that artists uh, fail when they take a role. I don't know. If what do you mean, artists fail when they take a role? Uh, As in, for change and for. I mean, social change. When they become political? And I, I try yeah. to, to... When they, when they, when they take a stand, their stance, they, they position. Take, exactly. They take a position in order to... But isn't this the exact so opposite? So it's a utilitarian... Mm -hmm. uh, sorry? So isn't this the exact opposite? He didn't take a stance. He purely yeah. aestheticized something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not to provoke. I don't. I think that's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that. What he did was bring to light the the um, the problem with North Korea. Yeah, I've heard I that. think that yeah, every single one of those that's people, what I'm saying. every single, single one of those people that are in that photograph now have a voice that would not have had a voice before. I would have never, you know what I mean? The aesthetic pleasing of each individual there, as and then as a group, what they are saying to me, I think it's great. Right, it's, it's hanging on the <laughs> CEO's wall. No, but it's hanging on the CEO's wall. That's so what? Office. So what? Well, Only he's going to see it. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm seeing it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree with Robin. No, I think it's not abundantly clear to me that that is not a critique of. North Koreans. I think that it's a criticism. I mean, it's, uh, okay, yeah, it, it's, if it's the context of being inside the CEO's office 
that's, I think, one of the main reasons why we're questioning that it's even being... Um, what did he do with this? It's a benevolent or banal uh, <laughs> representation. If you didn't have Mr. Volkswagen in the picture, you might be saying, oh yeah, it's a, it's a critique of uh, North Korean decadence and all the people who are yeah, suffering yeah, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So, I see, yeah. I don't know that it's clear one way or the other, but there was a documentary done about this, this Korean event, I mean, this one, but one of the, the annual ones, that did show you know, the fanfare and had, had great view. But what the documentary also did is it went behind the scenes and followed uh, a number of young, uh, young children who were involved in it and showed how brutal it was and what they had to do to prepare for it and how poor the family was and how desperate the children were that you know, the glorious leader was going to see me yeah. and he didn't show up. So that was, I think that was where it was kind of a, an accurate political statement. This is vague. Well, okay, it might be vague, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a critique. Mm -hmm. It's still vague. It might, no, it, it might not be result. overt, but it's still a critique, I think. Mm -hmm. The documentary is more overt in, in showing the, 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 the something else. Yeah. yeah. It's got that whole movement thing. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see it like this at all. I know, but, <laughs> that's, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's uh, okay. It, to, to be seen and, and to be validated, all those people are, to me are validated by Gursky. It may, and we don't have to take Gursky's intention into it at all. They would be an artist in that Can you say yeah. yeah. validated? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's, this is the piece that I'm struggling with. Yeah. In terms of, well, in your position, I'm, not, I'm struggling with your position about how they're not just, um, well, I'm not even thinking about the, they're, they're just, they're pixels on a, on a canvas. They're, mm. they're, they're not individuals, they're, they're, they're a mass. Yes, uh, yes. They're a color mass. Yes. That, that doesn't seem to me to have any kind of redemptive political or, there's no political critique in that, is there? It's pure objective uh, criticism, I, I guess. <laughs> Where was the criticism? The criticism is everyone knows what the story is in North Korea. And well, the story the picture, except the North Korea. He, he didn't choose to do uh, beautiful portraits of uh, Kim Jong Il. Uh, I think okay. that can speaks for itself. And, and I think that, yeah, the, the, uh, what it takes. What? The point. What? The, the fact that you know the story and then they're reduced or they're portrayed as yes. pixels in a color mask. Yes. Is critique. Yeah. That, that was, that was to use people like that almost yeah. as pixels. I'm like looking at these, the, these are each one of those as a human being, each one of those spots is a human being that is used for an overall aesthetic uh, uh, representation of, uh, of a horrible uh, regime that forced them to do that. It wasn't their own artistic choice to be Okay, you know, let me ask this. What's the difference? between that and the Beijing Olympics, where they had a very similar like mass movement of people. I mean, you know, unless, you, unless you have someone standing next to the painting telling everyone who's looking at it the context, how can that be political? I mean, it's, it just seems very convenient that the guy got paid a million dollars to make this very like critique, you know, of the CEO of Volkswagen. I don't think he has a painting of like Auschwitz next to it, you know. Like, no. He probably has like this <laughs> that painting next to it. It's like a, Good. You know, next to it's probably like a nice uh, nice flower, you know. I mean it just it's, I, I agree, it's, I agree, I agree. Um, first of all it's interesting that as a juxtaposition Volkswagen actually sponsors some very uh, uh, in my opinion, good art of a very different ilk uh, of uh, socially oriented practice inside the confines of their very own walls. Not that that makes I, I just it just complex uh, complexifies the situation yeah. a little bit. But uh, what I what I uh, have to ask is that uh, if you read uh, artistic interpretation in a materialist sense of uh, going back to like late Wittgenstein, don't ask what it means, ask what it does. How does it function? Then your guys' interpretations, as legitimate as they may be, they serve, they function as a minor interpretation in the economy of discourse that is uh, within the uh, art world. So if you wanted to uh, codify your interpretation and make it uh, a dominant, if not at least on the same 
level functionally, you would have to write an essay, then you would have to insert this essay into the economy of discourse and display of the art world, and then it would only then uh, maybe operate on the same level as an actual uh, legitimized opinion. That's, the, that's what makes this situation more complex, because we can give a million different interpretations, and only some are going to be codified. Yes, but it's, uh, it's uh, no, I, I agree, but it's in, in, interesting to see how those interpretations are contextualized. Um, I just always get um, uptight when I hear people talk about the art world because there's so many art worlds. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. it's, it's, a heterocon it's not even one art t time. It's heter I mean, I'm, I believe firmly in heterochronicity, but uh, but um, again, in terms of materialist <laughs> so, wow. functionality. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, but I think there's something to be said for uh, both interpreting the artist as a civic member, just to Paul's point, like somebody, you know, there is something about that differentiation between the purpose of the art and the purpose of the artist that is kind of part of that art world's way of destroying, you know, and, and, and kind of keeping these voices from being heard. And then just also acknowledging that, you know, the most powerful art worlds in the world probably are like ceramics centers and community centers all over. Like, <laughs> there's a whole other sort of discourse that, that happens that doesn't have anything to do with this discussion, which is still valid. There, there's, yeah. That's a beautiful point. You're talking about it as somebody who's been through the economics of art, you know, at the Drucker School in terms of analysis. I mean, there's a great book if you want to learn it. It's the Handbook on Arts and Culture, the Economics of Arts and Culture. I mean, it's a handbook. It could give you all the statistics you need to know about the dollar exchanges, about the types of people that are involved, about the dynamics that are in play. This is not a mystery by any means. The actual dollars that are exchanged except for black market sales and transfers of art, uh, are, are known. These are the, more or less, you know, the, 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 at the top levels of the, this economy, there are things that are done that no one understands because they're intentionally carried out by people who don't want you to know what they do. And this is a problem. So now, in terms of understanding what these art worlds are, they're, they're very distinct. They're not, you're talking about one that is really a democratic, a democratic structure that is built out from the bottom up of an ancient way of looking at what people do within the context of their own societies. You know, that is intelligible, that is, that is meaningful. And specifically, it's our own faults for assuming that capital exchange means dominance. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's, I, I that's the that. failure. That's wonderful that all this money is flowing around like that, but I don't really have access to that. And, I don't think most people do. and the question is whether or not you, 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 you know, if you really want to fight that, then you, that, that requires the kind of change that everyone understands, which is that you actually have to confront it. That's the only way historically that's been. But that's, a kind of, that's, that's a kind of uh, love for it. Yeah. You know, Okay, should we still, should we continue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah uh, otherwise we'll just argue for happening. Yeah. Uh, uh, so argue. Uh, let me, we, we make a break afterwards, but just to, to, uh, to, to situate, because some of you know Thomas de Man works, and, and others do not, so. Um, uh, before I continue, and, and you see, I, I sh I'm, I'm showing one uh, uh, of his photographs. It's very simple, what you have to know is, that uh, since the 90s, Thomas de Man is uh, looking for photographs, press photographs, others, um, of specific historical moments, which may be of a super, on a super level of, of, a, of world history, like the assault on the bun uh, Hitler bunker, which you see here, in, in 43. Um, uh, they may be of minor importance, of other things, uh, which uh, like uh, uh, the house of the murderer, or where murder is killed. He builds, has those photographs, and then he builds models which are one-to-one -one scale, and he photographs those models, and then he destroys the models afterwards. And the fact of destroying the models has a certain importance. And then he titles, and the, the photographs are quite large, so they have the size more or less what you see here. Uh, and uh, then he titles the uh, uh, 
know this, uh, the, the, um, um, the photographs, uh, but in a way that you cannot read semantically the historical reference in the title. So this is more or less what Thomas de Maas did. Um, let's make, take 10 minutes till half past and then we make a break. Yeah? Um, so by saying nothing about the lie, we do not therefore tell the truth. Others like Jacques Rancière have written copiously on the global art market, there we are, that synthesizes gazes and views so that it will, uh, that uh, uh, I do not have to put my attention and focus my attention here. What is more, my concern is the works and not the artists, even if it's necessary to include the artists in this particular context. More than the others, this applies especially for the work, to the work of Thomas de Mart, which probably, because it was once theoretically, so in the 90s, so exciting, is left astonishingly, astonish, astonishingly undescribed by the critics. In the press, or in the numerous catalogue articles on Thomas de Mart, his work always disappears behind the, to quote Adorno, the logic of its having been produced. So people are fascinated by the handcraft, the one-to-one -one scale, and the subsequent shredding of the models, by the hygiene, the appealing purity of the diasex surfaces, by the formal monumentality, predominantly by the form, and little by the content. For critiques, Thomas de Mar is the artist per se of the diffuse public image, of the privatization of the public image, as he himself says, particularly when he confesses to this in numerous interviews, like for example in his conversation with Bernard Burgi, 1998, in the Kunsthalle Zürich, I quote, the fleeting impression of the immaculateness of all the objects, their timelessness, evoked by the total absence of all wear and wear and tear, wear and tear, and the equal status of all visible surfaces, convey a basically theoretical, utopian view of the world, which now shows itself again only in the photo, Thomas de Mark said, end of quote. The utopia of the surface. It is as the moment it is at the moment where the internal horizon is obscured that a utopian prospective horizon is washed away. Or to say to the Ernst Block, where the prospective horizon is omitted, reality only appears as what has been, as dead. And it is the dead ones, namely naturalists and empiricists, who bury their dead there. Almost, so like this is just called Munich, and it's the drawing room where Munich after 45 uh, was reconstructed. So there are always the precise historical reference, which you have to find. You cannot find them in the photograph. You cannot find them in the title, but you have to look for them. So, uh, so how do you find them? Is it, uh, you, you find it because either it's said in the catalog, uh, or you, the you catalog, or, yeah, or the critiques, or whatever, but never in the images. Well, of course, other, unless it's very famous, which has entered public uh, uh, iconic consciousness already, or memory. Uh, but if not, like this one, you wouldn't. So you have to search for it. Uh, or this is, if I remember well, and there's lots have been written about those photos, uh, especially those. This is, if I remember well, is a, an uh, ancient office of the Stasi, the GDR uh, Stasi, uh, which was left in '89, before just when the war came down. Uh, and people commented a lot on the fact that all the papers there, they were black. Of course they're black. What else should they be? 
because you know it's a photograph uh, uh, of which a reconstruction of a photograph that he's doing. Um, so of course you can now start saying, well, all the pages are blank, so we can put our context, our content, whatever you may say, in there, which is a bit super visual. or the kitchen of a uh, murderer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a space simulation model. A real space simulation model that he reconstructed. So you go in there to have a non-gravity state. Should we make a break first? Yeah.